Okay, we have uh, run down the entire uh, evolutionary tree of critters that could possibly result in human infections, all the way from things which barely have DNA all the way up to uh, multicellular organisms that may look a lot like we do. Uh, and uh, what I want to do now, hopefully a little bit more logical and not throwing so many uh, wor big words at you, is talk about general concepts of the way uh, we can defend ourselves or the barriers that we have from infectious pathogens in general. And I hope this is very, very logical, but when you think that you have a body which should remain uh, pathogen free, the basic defense between this body and all the critters we just talked about are, uh, first of all, all anatomic mucosal uh, possibilities. Skin, GI tract, mucosa, respiratory mucosa from airborne inhalation, from oral ingestion, and even uh, urogenital. All of these have are designed to protect us. They have a certain arrangement of cells. They are underlined by uh, lymphoid tissue. They may secrete uh, substances uh, which have antibodies. And this basically is the steady state system that we have to protect ourselves from pathogens. It's the breakdown of these barriers that results in infections in general, no matter what type of uh, organism from the uh, phylogenetic uh, tree that we're talking about. When you think about an infection going on in a region of the body, uh, and you can talk about spread of an infection as well. This is also another general term. And if you think about it, or if you want to think about it, the spread of an infection is pretty much follows the same routes and same channels as the uh, spread of a tumor. First of all, you can have a direct extension of the inflammatory process into all the surrounding regions. So if you know where the infection is and you know what the neighbors are, <coughs> you might suspect that some of these neighbors can become involved with direct extension. Uh, lymphatics pick up uh, inflammation and bacteria and antigens and lymphocytes and neutrophils and debris uh, and process them through lymph nodes just as though it was a tumor process pathogens and inflammatory uh, processes can get into the bloodstream and infect every place that the blood goes to, which of course is everywhere. And it can also follow uh, nerve uh, tracks or uh, nerve um, sheaths as well. This is exactly the same type of pattern we see with uh, malignant tumors, isn't it? When we talk about a release or transmission of pathogens now as a concept, no matter what uh, type of organism we're talking about, one of the ways to release a pathogen is anatomically uh, possible skin shedding, coughing or sneezing through the urine, through the feces, through the blood, or by virtue of, of vectors or another uh, type of uh, organism, usually an insect, which acts as an intermediary in the dissemination of the pathogen. Another general release, which is not quite anatomically as logical as the rest of these, are what we call STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. And those are usually either uh, mucosal, blood, fluid, kind of uh, oriented. So, but it's still considered to be a type of uh, transmission. We'll talk about the sexually transmitted diseases. Another main principle uh, which will never uh, die is something that's big enough uh, and important enough to summarize in these three little letters. It might look like Ohm's Law to you if you're an electrical engineer, but uh, no matter what kind of infectious process we talk about in a human, the thing you always have to keep in mind is that the overall infectivity of a pathogen is directly proportional to this concept of what we call virulence or the capability of an organism to cause an infection. So I is directly proportional to V. However, 
it's inversely proportional to this thing that we call resistance, which is your immune system. So this is why many, many, many horribly, potentially horrible uh, virulent organisms might not produce much of an overall infectious response simply because uh, there's a lot of body resistance or a uh, strong immune system. On the other hand, when this R gets smaller or your resistance or immunity goes down, even the most wimpy of pathogens can cause major, major, major infections, including many organisms, organisms which normally don't even infect us. So let's talk about one last concept of infectivity again. Uh, no matter what type of a bug we're talking about before we get into the inf specific infectivities. A pathogen can have a direct effect or an agent, if you will, on a host cell. That's the most clear, straightforward type of infectivity, you know, because ultimately it's cells which are damaged or, or it's involved in infectious processes. The agent or the pathogen can produce toxins. This is very, very often seen with bacteria, whether they're endotoxins or exotoxins, which cause the necrosis or the effect on the cell. On the other hand, the agent may evoke a host cellular immune response, which is significant enough to cause damage and death and necrosis as well. So what does this mean? Maybe I should have made this a little more logical. A bug can get to your cell directly. It can make toxins which get to your cells. Or in the process of your body reacting against this bug, you can have cell damage on the basis of that reaction. Okay, now that we have gone into infectivity in general, let's say a couple of specific words about some of the organisms. We'll start with viruses and then go up to bacteria. Well, the common thing about all viruses, besides the other things we mentioned, whether it's single or double-stranded DNA or RNA, uh, is that they have to attach to a cell. So they have to, way, have to have a way to get in. Once they get in, they have to uh, transcribe, they have to undergo transcription in order to uh, replicate and make the things that they normally do. So all viruses have to attach, they have to enter the cell, they have to undergo transcription, and then with the handful of genes that they have in them, they have to use the host's um, materials for translation. This may result in seeing perhaps some viral inclusions inside of a cell. Or perhaps we can see, uh, if the cell is damaged enough, which it often is, reduced host cell function. Or perhaps cell injury or lysis or death. On the other hand, that virus can live in a cell perhaps for many, many years without causing much uh, disease or uh, change of any type and just stay there. Uh, these so-called latency, large latency periods of viruses in cells are often uh, uh, talked about when we talk about latent viruses perhaps uh, causing a neoplasm. So really, what are the few things viruses can do? Well, they can stay in your cell, they could damage your cell, uh, or they could just stay there for a long time and ultimately result in mutations which are going to result in neoplasms. We mentioned a whole wide variety of them in the chapter on neoplasm, and we may make a few references now as well. So that's the general uh, possibilities for viral infectivity. We'll start the next group with bacterial infectivity, and I thank you very much.